Hello, friends of human spaceflight, and welcome to another week in review as we look into the space industry and notable launch activities from around the world. Coming up, we have quite an international flavor this week, with China and India at the forefront of this week's launch activities. A new crew were sent to the Heavenly Palace where they will spend the next six months. India launched a new sophisticated satellite to service its navigation needs. We're back at Vandenberg again this week for yet another Starlink launch, and as always, we take a quick look at how it went. Big props to Axiom Space on the safe return of the AX2 crew. Let's take a look at what they got up to up there and what Axiom has lined up as we look to the future. Let's go. On Monday, a geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle, or GSLV, of Indian origin successfully lifted off, carrying the first of a new series of upgraded regional navigation satellites. The rocket, standing nearly 170 feet tall, lifted off at 10.42 am local time, approximately 50 miles north of Chennai on the Bay of Bengal. It was India's fourth orbital launch of the year. The GSLV Mark II rocket deployed the NVS-01 satellite into orbit, joining India's existing fleet of navigation spacecraft that cover the Indian subcontinent and its neighbors. This new satellite enhances the coverage provided by the United States, Russia, China, and Europe, which all operate global fleets of navigation satellites. The actual countdown for the mission began 27 hours before liftoff, with ground crews loading the rocket's second stage and four liquid fueled boosters with storable hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide propellants. Ooh, a nice safe mixture there, eh, viewers? Notably, the rocket's core stage utilizes pre packed solid propellant. Always great to see hammers used on such assemblies during integration. The strap-on boosters rely on liquid fuel, making it distinct from other launchers which are typically solid. The only payload aboard the rocket was the NVS-01 navigation satellite, weighing approximately 4,920 pounds, or 2,232 kilograms. The satellite, built by India, was destined for a geostationary orbit over the equator, situated more than 22,000 miles, nearly 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Following injection into an elongated transfer orbit by the hydrogen-fueled third stage, the NVS-01 satellite will utilize its own propulsion system to circulate its orbit in the forthcoming weeks. The NVS-01 satellite represents the first of the second generation series for India's regional navigation system, known as Navigation with Indian Constellation, or NAVIC, or the Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. Between 2013 and 2018, India launched nine first generation navigation satellites using the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. The new second generation NVS satellites are larger and heavier, hence the use of the GSLV's lifting power. The new satellite has been designed to be compatible with global navigation networks of other nations as well. Approximately 18 minutes after launch, the GSLV's Mark II rocket's third stage released the NVS-01 satellite into orbit with everyone going into party mode. The Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, later confirmed that the rocket had placed the payload into a satisfactory orbit. NBS-01 is currently on its way to a geosynchronous orbit with an inclination of about 5 degrees to the equator, where it will join the operational satellites comprising the Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. NBS-01 will replace the problematic IRNSS-1G satellite, which unfortunately encountered issues with its navigation payload. Present, six first-generation navigation satellites from India are actively providing positioning and timing services. However, one satellite was lost due to a launch failure in 2017, and two others had technical glitches with their atomic clocks, which are used for time-tagging navigational signals in the L-band. These atomic clocks aid in measuring the distance between the satellites and ground users. The new NVS satellites will introduce an indigenous atomic clock design to replace the existing Swiss-made clocks on older satellites. Additionally, the new spacecraft will incorporate a new L-band signal in addition to the existing L5 signal. The new generation satellites offer more secure navigation signals and are designed to be more user-friendly for civilians. 
There are five satellites of this new series configuration planned for future launches. This launch marks the 15th flight of India's GSLV Mark II rocket, which has undergone upgrades since its initial launch in 2001. The enhancements include more powerful engines and the replacement of the Russian upper stage with an Indian-built counterpart. Additionally, it served as the first GSLV Mark II launch following a failure in 2021. A subsequent investigation found a leaky vent and relief valve on the cryogenic third stage of the rocket resulted in diminished pressure levels in the liquid hydrogen fuel tank. The third stage engine failed to ignite as a result, causing the rocket and its Earth observation satellite payload to return to Earth soon after. Modifications made to the cryogenic stage and lessons learned mean enhanced reliability of the cryogenic stage. A new future for India's space aspirations awaits. China launched a crew of three astronauts to their space station earlier in the week. There were two first-time space travelers among them. Amid scenes of national pride, they made their way to the pad and the ride that would take them to space. With high fives all round, it was time to board and in no time at all, we saw liftoff as the crowd cheered them on. Interesting to see during the ascent here just how quickly the boosters were jettisoned followed almost immediately by core stage separation. Like clockwork, panels deployed to provide power as the spacecraft then began the process to chase down their orbital outpost. As soon as they reached space, a new record was made, that of 17 people orbiting the Earth. Almost seven hours after launch, the crew docked with the station's Tianhe core module some 400 kilometers above Earth. The crew will spend the next five months living and working aboard the Tiangong space station. SpaceX were ready to go again on Tuesday, May 30th from Vandenberg Space Force Base on the West Coast. Conditions were ideal for launch for Falcon 9, with payload fairings holding another 52 Starlink V1.5 satellites. Just after 11pm local time, Falcon 9 lifted off, powered by the flight-proven core stage having supported Crew-1 and Crew-2 missions in the past, among others. Note to camera operator, don't rotate the view. I almost died inside thinking they lost it here. In no time at all, we saw the routine sequence of events of main engine cutoff, stage separation and fairing jettison exposing the payload to the vacuums of space. The second stage continued on its merry way with the successful payload deployment later confirmed on social media. Meanwhile, the booster successfully landed downrange on the autonomous drone ship of course I still love you, which was stationed in the Pacific Ocean. This marked another successful booster recovery for SpaceX as they continue to develop reusable rockets to reduce the cost of spaceflight and takes the number of active satellites to a little over 4,000. SpaceX plans to launch many more in the coming years to further expand the coverage and capabilities of the Starlink network, with version 2 mini satellites already being launched using Falcon 9 ahead of eventual full-size version 2 deployments using Starship. Our published schedule meant we couldn't cover some of the Memorial Day weekend news for you. A special moment here to share especially so for our US viewers. Remembering those lost, honoring those who have come before and inspiring new generations to strive forward. What better way to highlight this than the living legends of the Apollo missions? How cool was it to see Apollo 9 lunar module pilot Rusty Schweikart Apollo 16 moonwalker Charlie Duke and Apollo 17 geologist Harrison Jack Schmidt serving as Grand Marshals. This was a first ever for astronauts to participate in this manner and what a deserving honor. Thanks to the brave crews at that time in history, the Apollo era will always be an inspiration to us all as humanity reaches deeper into space. Last time we talked about the Axiom 2 mission. This was the 10th crewed flight of the Dragon and on the 31st of March, the four astronauts safely arrived back to Earth. After spending eight days on the ISS, they boarded the Freedom spaceship and then undocked from the International Space Station. The Dragon proceeded on the usual path and after the deorbit burn and separation from the service module, the capsule re-entered the atmosphere of our planet. This phase of the return is very spectacular. The fiery plasma is turning the spaceship into a bright fireball with a long trail. It must be an exciting experience for the travelers on board. Now ask yourself, would you try it? We would. After this hot part, as the Freedom slowed and cooled down, it opened the two smaller drogue chutes, which stabilized the vehicle, preparing for the opening of the four main chutes. 
The four cupola open flawlessly, slowing the fall of the spaceship even further. The spotlight's lit descent ended in a splashdown into the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. The ninja divers swam to the capsule and prepared it for being picked up by the SpaceX recovery ship. The vessel, called Megan, maneuvered to the floating spaceship and elevated it out of the ocean. With the help of the ship's crew, they left the Freedom spaceship. Mission Commander Peggy Whitson, John Schaffner as pilot, and the two Saudi mission specialists, Rihanna Bernawi and then Ali Al Karni. So, Axiom Space conducted another successful mission, proving their expertise and also the validity of their business model. The next Axiom mission is not far. At the end of this year, AX-3 will bring another four astronauts to the ISS, including an Italian Air Force colonel and another pilot from the Turkish Air Force. And in the middle of 2024, AX-4 is already planned to visit the space station. One of the crew members will be the winner of the Space Hero reality show, and the fourth will be a Hungarian astronaut. Commercial space travel opens the way for the different nationalities to reach space besides participating in common programs of the old space agencies like NASA, ESA and Roscosmos. The scientific program of AX2 was pretty varied and they managed to complete it. Great job! We talked a bit about that in the last episode. But we'd like to revisit one of those many experiments. It is called skin suit. This time, mission specialist Rihanna Bernawi wore the special intravehicular activity suit during the mission. The aim of this gravity-loading countermeasure skin suit, or skin suit for short, is to mitigate the negative effects of staying in a microgravity environment by simulating the Earth gravity with a vertical load on the body from the shoulders to the feet. With me? Awesome. The future LEO, Moon and Mars mission astronauts could use this suit to supplement the exercises which help to maintain their good health during the missions. The development of skin suit lasted many years. This is the seventh version of it, Mark 7. The skin suit's previous version already flew in 2015 and 16 to the International Space Station. Professor David Newman is the principal investigator of the skin suit project at MIT. We can know that she was in the development team of the Biosuit project as well. It was presented back in 2014 and aimed to create an alternative of the inflated type of spacesuits. From early space flights, these kinds of suits were used. The Apollo astronauts happened to use these and they are still in use on the ISS. The Biosuit project is still alive and it was presented in 2022 in a Mars conference. There are similarities between the two kinds of suits, but biosuit can be used in space, while skin suit can only be used in pressurized habitats or vehicles. The biosuit offers many advantages compared to the traditional style spacesuits. The movement is much easier in this. The suit is lighter and fixing the biosuit is also much easier. Not to mention that any damage on the biosuit doesn't cause the sudden loss of pressure on the whole body, which is a risk with the traditional inflated spacesuits, so it's safer too. We hope we will see skin suits and biosuits in future missions, helping the space generation to live and work on other planets, moons, and on space stations. Well, that's it for now, with a nice hand-picked selection of other amazing news to share with you. We look forward to bringing you the latest developments in space news next week and some fun along the way. Thanks for watching, and remember, onwards to the future. Vocals. Volume. Here we go. Big props to Axiom Space. YouTube notification. Go away and can't say the script. <laughs> Redo that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Oh god. The ninja divers sw swarm. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that one again.